Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you for joining us uh, today for the inaugural seminar uh, of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us today. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx communities across the Americas. And I couldn't think of a better scholar to, to get us started in this journey than today's speaker, Jessica Bretis. Jessica is an associate professor at the School of Journalism and also a program director at the Masters of Bilingual Journalism, both at the University of Arizona. My colleague and friend, Maylene Hopwood uh, from the Medill School at Northwestern University will introduce Jessica in just a second. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Jibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. Northwestern was also, this was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native, native peoples and the institution's history with them, consistent with the Northwestern's university commitment to diversity and, of, and inclusion. Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me briefly say how about the seminar will unfold and then we'll get started. Uh, first, Mei Ling will tell us a little bit more about Jessica's research and career. Then Jessica will present for 30 minutes or so. And after that, we'll open for questions. You know, there's a Q&A box there. Please feel free to enter your questions uh, as a, the seminar progresses. Uh, once Jessica finishes her presentation, Mei Ling and I will moderate the questions. And at the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. And without further ado, uh, Mei Ling, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much. We are so excited at Northwestern and, and really the world, um, given the um, diversity of our participants today, to have Dr. Redis with us. Um, just briefly, because her CV is so esteemed and um, she's had, she has so many accomplishments, um, Dr. Redis holds a major in communications from the University of Lima, a master's in Latin American studies from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and a doctorate in contemporary Latin America um, from the Complutense University of Madrid, uh, uh, Madrid. Um, she um, has worked for more than two decades in media in Peru, Mexico, and Spain, as, and has trained bilingual journalists uh, previously and currently working in various newsrooms in the U.S. and abroad. Her um, areas of research include Latin American international migration, diasporas and transnational communities, cultural industries, ethnic media, diversity and the media, Latino media in Europe, North America and Asia, bilingual journalism, journalism studies, and journalism education. She is co-editor of the Handbook of Diasporas, Media and Culture, and co-author of Latin Americans in London, Narratives of Migration, Relocation, and Belonging. She, um, a, a recent report that is, um, that is a great follow-up for you to check out is Hispanic Media to a uh, report called Hispanic Media Today, serving bilingual and bicultural audiences in the digital age, um, which was sponsored by the Democracy Fund. I actually assigned it in my class and she was generous enough to spend some time with our students last year. Um, she um, 
previously worked at California State University Northridge and, and joined um, the University of Arizona in 2019 to help launch and lead the first master's in bilingual journalism program there. We are so honored to have uh, Dr. Redis with us today to share her knowledge and experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, can you see my um, screen? Can I have a note? Okay, perfect, great. So uh, basically what I'm bringing here and most of the um, ideas I'm gonna share today, you can find in some of my publications I'm gonna um, share with you later on. But I always want to uh, explain a little bit of my uh, journey so you can understand why I'm doing this type of research and where I'm coming from, right? So I, as uh, Maylin mentioned, I am Peruvian, so I was born in Lima and I started working there as a journalist, but I didn't know I was Peruvian until I moved to Mexico, right? And I, like, like I always uh, tell my students, you realize your identity is uh, also a relational identity, right? So in Mexico, I was Peruvian and I worked there and I uh, started doing research on Latin America, especially in um, media and propaganda. Then I moved to Madrid and I was, um, um, turn into South American, right? South American uh, or La Latino American, right? Be because it wasn't the growth of the beginning of the growth of uh, Latin American immigrants in in Europe and in the in Spain specifically. And I started uh, conducting research there about that, and we'll explain it later how how I did it. And then in 2008, I moved to Los Angeles, and I turned into a Latina, right? Yeah, it was very interesting to go into this different not only understanding and how people um, see you and how you identify yourself and how your relational um, identity moves from one place to another. But when I moved to the US, I was wondering if I could compare my research funding from Spain to the United States. At the very beginning, I wanted to compare both um, countries and then realized that um, it was more interesting to try to understand global cities, which is why I started the comparison between Los Angeles, the city I was living, but also New York and also Miami. As most of you would know, the three largest Latino audiences, uh, according to, to Nielsen. So most of my research is dedicated to this type of comparisons and not only about uh, news media, but also about cultural industry. But because I was also very connected to Europe before coming to California, and um, I was conducting a research into um, television and public service, comparing BBC and Televisión Española. So I was moving, um, I was visiting so for several um, um, times uh, London, and I realized that the Latino uh, population was growing over there. So my research started also comparing and analyzing and understanding uh, what's going, what was going on with Latin American immigrants arriving to this hyper-diverse city and the invisibility of Latinos in this area. Three years ago, I started a sabbatical and I was wondering if all these different areas and comparison trends that I was um, in fact, Europe and North America was similar in other areas, which is why I started a research on um, Latin, Latin American immigrants in Japan, specifically in Tokyo. So I started learning Japanese, which was uh, very challenging for me. And I went to conduct um, research uh, field work in Tokyo, but when people started asking, why are you going to Tokyo? Are there Latin, Latin American in, in, uh, in Japan? My answer would be yes. The majority of them comes from Brazil and from Peru. So it was a three part field work. So I went to conduct research in Tokyo, but also in Sao Paulo. And I went back to Lima. Uh, to conduct research on Latino and um, Japanese Peruvians, right? So more or less, this is my, um, the way I have been um, moving around in trying to understand the reality of international migrations from Latin America. And this is part of what I published in one of my book chapters. I'm looking to Latin Americans moving around. And if you see the numbers here, in the 80s, we had around 6 million. In the 90s, around 11 million. In the 2000s, 26 million. In 2010, around uh, 20.5 million. So we will say that 30 million people live outside Latin America and 73% 73 outside 
Latin America. Let's say three out of four Latin Americans living abroad live outside the, the, the region. And the majority of the countries are from Mexico, Colombia, El Salvador, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Peru, Ecuador, Guatemala, Brazil, and Argentina. Of course, we're looking for the numbers in the 2020, and we will need to incorporate also Venezuelans here uh, in this scenario, right? So, uh, and in the main countries, in North America is the United States, in Europe is Spain, and in Asia is Japan. Um, so I'm concentrating the attention on these three, and you will see in the comparison that I'm going to present. I'm interested in understanding all these um, situations. So my area of research basically are related to international migration and news media in comparative perspective. In the area of international migration, I'm interested in demographic, historical context, political economy, cultural study, of course, sociology. In the area of news media studies, I'm interested in news media representation, news media coverage, ethnic media production, ethnic media consumption, of course, sociology of news media. So in the area of Latin Americans in Europe, basically I've done, it was one of the first uh, studies on Latin, uh, Latinx media representation. I compared País El Mundo and ABC uh, to ABC, uh, ABC, uh, and it was a comparison on how mainstream media in Spain portrayed Colombians, Ecuadorians, and Argentinians. Also the first, one of the first studies on media consumption in rural and, um, and urban areas, because I was interested in see the trends of that. And also I produced the first mapping of ethnic media in Madrid at that time. Staying in Europe, I'm glad to, to mention that we just published this book with my co-author, Patria Roman Velasquez. It's about Latin Americans in London, narratives of migration, relations, and belonging. When I moved to the US, I started publishing also in these areas, Latin media representation, Latin media in global cities, Latin media consumption. But I was always interested in not only news media consumption and news media production, um, be because I've been visiting so many um, Latinx newsrooms, but also in the Spanish language cultural circuits. So one of the latest publications that I, uh, we're about to present in next, next week it's a study about Spanish language cultural circuits in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. So what I'm trying to address there is uh, the understanding of uh, the challenges and the opportunities that most of actors, directors, producers, writers are facing when they, they produce um, Spanish language cultural products, right? And then when it comes to Latin America in Asia, oh, and also I forgot to, to mention that I'm writing a book about Latino media in the US, uh, which is gonna have, um, a, a, a comprehension of um, the, um, the history and the, the current trends and uh, what I think would be the future of Latin, Latinx media in the US. And when it comes to Latin Americans in Asia, I'm also looking at Latin media representation of um, the, the representation of Latinos in Japanese media, but also uh, the production of ethnic media in global cities and the Latino consumption of what, what uh, it's in, which is second, third, fourth generation of um, Latin Americans with Japanese descent. And the film work is in Tokyo, Sao Paulo and Lima, I'm writing a book about that. And, but I published one piece of, uh, of this um, ongoing findings in the Sage Handbook of Media Migration. The title of the chapter is Migration and Media Between Asia and Latin America, just Japanese Brazilians in Tokyo and Sao Paulo. But another area that I'm very interested in is journalism studies, journalism education, and more particularly in journal, uh, bilingual journalism, how we are forming and educating bilingual journalists. I hope we have so many questions about that at the end in the Q&A session, but uh, what I want to say is all these experience of, of being a former journalist and also being an educator in different countries and teach in English and Spanish, and then have my former students already uh, working out there, uh, has given me a perspective of um, the future, the current trends and the future of bilingual education. So going back again into international migration and news media, uh, when it comes to North America, what I'm about to mention and uh, explain a little bit, it's based on the chapter, Homogenizing Heterogeneity in Transnational Context, Latin American Diasporas and the Media in the Global North. That is part of a book that we just uh, recently edited with my colleague Rosa Sagarosa No. The Handbook of Diaspora Media and Culture is part of the IMCR publications. And the report that is uh, out there as well in PDF, Hispanic Media Today, serving bilingual and bicultural audiences. So basically, I'm going to start with demographics and migration. When I start talking about demographics and immigration, I always tell my students, okay, when we think about the, uh, the geographical distribution of Latinos in the US, we need 
to take into account two particular momentous. One is 1848. So that moment when this, all this area became part of the United States. So um, Mexicans were already living here, Spanish language population, uh, speaking populations were already here. So basically it's not that they crossed the border, but the border crossed them, which is when we try to understand Latinx media, we have to take that into account. So Spanish language population were there, their production was there, sorry about that. Their uh, pop uh, population were there and Spanish language cultural industries were already being produced there, especially um, newspapers, um, publications and theater. Other big momentum is 1898, of course, when we uh, um, Puerto Rico became part of the U.S. So if we see that in, at the very beginning, oh, sorry about that. The uh, the Latino population was uh, at the very beginning U.S. Latinos that were already here, but also the beginning of Latin American immigrants. And we don't have time to go uh, in depth into all the historical um, um, processes: the Second World War, the First World War, etc., the 70s, but I want to stay in a two or three decades that have been very significant, significant in the growth of Latin American immigrants. And I would say I will go back to the 80s. So if you see the map of the US, uh, the Latino population in the 80s, uh, you will see the concentration, high concentration of Latinos in the Southwest, of course, uh, because of the um, historical reasons, and also in Florida and part of, uh, of the East Coast, right? If we see the 80s, you will see the difference, and we will see the, the, 20, the 2000, you will see the difference, and 2006. So what we're seeing is not only the initial geographical concentration, but also geographical dispersion, right? And one of the latest maps that we had is that not only the concentration of Latinos in this area, but also the geographical dispersion in new areas. And you will see, we're going back to these maps again, and this will help us understand the geographical concentration and dispersion also of Latino media, right? I use Portes and Pellegrino to understand how Latin America was uh, already diverse and how Latin Americans, when they leave the different Latin American countries, are also very diverse. So uh, instead of thinking as a one unique homogeneous group, we need to think, of, well, we, we share commonalities, but we are very diverse as well, right? So. And when I put this into perspective with what happened in the US, Spain, and Japan, you will see that the 80s in Latin America, we uh, critical analysis uh, call it the lost decade, the same with the 90s, the second lost decade. And the 2000 to 2010, we, we can uh, talk about the effects of neoliberalism and the structural reforms in Latin America and how middle classes and immigration flows started um, having the, uh, the consequences of these different uh, kind of political and social scenarios in Latin America. But if you see in the US, we're talking about Hispanic boom, then the, the US another Latino boom, and then into the 2000s, the constituency of the majority minority. And then how the US now, instead of talking about only about immigrants, we're talking about US born Latinos. But if you look at Spain, we are having the same train in, in the 80s and the 90s, we have the newcomers. Then in the, in the change of the century, we have the preferred of the 21st century. And in the 2010s, we have a second and third migratory processes, which is very interesting because that directly affected to the production, distribution, and consumption of Latinx media. And the same comes in Japan, the, the, the 80s and the 90s, what the, the, the very interesting, in the 90s, we start seeing the Dekaseki movement, which is the, 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 the frame uh, work is coming to, to Japan. But in the 2010s, we see second and third migratory processes as well. So what we're seeing in uh, demographics is uh, the decrease of uh, foreign born um, in, in Latinx in, in the US, uh, but the growth now, if we see the, the comparative, is more into the US Latinx. So what, what it means? It means that we are very diverse communities and also we have very diverse and heterogeneous media catering in Latinos, right? And now I want to talk a little bit about bilingualism and biculturalism. Look, the United States is gonna be the second largest Spanish language speaking country, which is why there is an, uh, an, an interest in um, producing um, media in Spanish, in English, bilingual, etc. But when it comes to our reality, we see that uh, Latinos, we uh, have different abilities to speak English or, or, or Spanish. It depends on our generation. It depends on the migratory process. It, de it depends on how long have you been here. It depends on uh, your level of education. It, de it depends on where you live. 
uh, etc. So different variables that affect these different um, and, uh, constituencies of uh, Spanish language or bilingual um, skills. And it's more when it comes to English language um, states, right? I want to just um, mention a little bit this kind of, um, it's a little bit oldie, but I like that because it's from Joshua and Solorzano, of the Chicano uh, Educational Pipeline. And it springs out how difficult it is for some groups of like, Latino communities uh, to go from elementary school. You see 100 uh, um, students in elementary school. Out of this 146 go to um, graduate from high school. 17 go to community college, 26 go enrolling college, nine go to four-year college, one transfer for four-year college, eight graduate from a bachelor's degree, two get a professional degree, and less than one get a, a doctoral degree. That's why it's so important to uh, realize that also education is uh, can be um, a, a context that we need to take into account when it comes to Latinx communities. Another piece of information for us to understand Latinx media is our um, um, role as consumers or citizens, and it comes to economics and politics, right? So basically, uh, in the, we, we, uh, and we are close to elections, uh, the, the public discourse tend to talk about the force of the Latino vote. In reality, it's um, estimated that out of uh, the 100% of Latinos, like half percent are eligible to vote, and out of them, around half of them actually cast the vote, which means that our uh, political citizenship is not effective at, at, at 100 percent, right? But it can, when it comes to the economy, yes, because we have the right to work and, and process. Whether you have documents or not, you're working and you're producing. So it's estimated between 1.5 or 1 to 7 trillion spending power. Uh, which means when we consume, we don't only consume products, but also cultural products. So our force as consumers, as uh, cultural consumers, is, uh, it's, uh, is growing as our diversity is growing as well. So again, we think about these different media with these different scenarios, right? So also the Spanish language cultural industries, we have around 60, 60 million of, uh, around 17% of the population that is expected to go into 30% by the 50s. Uh, Spanish language speaker, it varies depending on who's counting and how they are counting. Around 41 million of native speakers or around 11 uh, that have limited competency. Uh, and it, it, it gives us the idea of uh, the growth of Spanish language speakers, but also how this is also evolving into being bilingual. And this is needs to take into account when we, we see the different realities of the different media. So we have Spanish language newspapers or bilingual newspapers, I, I, I uh, prefer to, to, to mention, 200, more than 210 years, radio around 80 years, TV around 60 years, online almost a decade or more than that, social media six to seven years, and now we have mainstream media in Espanol as well. We have had mainstream media from English to Espanol in several momentum of the history of Latino media, but we're going to talk about what's going on right now because we don't have time to talk about the history. So when, we, when I, I, I um, go into the mapping of Latinx media, I always tell my students it's interesting to understand different levels. Ownership can be private, public, community-based language. It can be Spanish, English, uh, and other languages, native languages as well. Geography, they can be national, local, hyperlocal, trans transnational, but also translocal. And we need to take that into consideration when we're thinking about these diverse um, momentums of Latin, Latinx media and format. Print, well, less print, more online, radio, and we're moving to the podcast area. TV, we're moving to the video for the web, and also social media. So going back to the map, we see the map, the concentration and dispersion of Latinos. We see the concentration and dispersion and these areas are growing. So that reflects uh, the different markets that we have in uh, for Hispanic market, for Latino ma markets, right? You will see the concentration in the areas that were concentrated and the dispersion and the beginning of new markets where we are getting the dispersion, the geographical dispersion. So these are different levels, historical backgrounds and the, uh, the skills and languages help us understand why we have these di very diverse um, uh, practices when it comes to consuming media, right? So we have people that consume English and Spanish in time, which is my case and most of uh, your professors, and uh, um, consuming uh, only English sometimes, consuming only Spanish. So you see, we cannot talk about the um, Latin Latinx audience, and also the way we consume English and Spanish. You see, if we have more people, US born Latinos, obviously English is gonna be the first language. 
So we see that in a timeline. We will see the 80s. At the, uh, before the 80s, we have all these green and traditional media. In the, in the 80s, the, the first booming of Latino media, the 90s, the second booming of Latino media until the change of the century. And then with the, the, with the 2000s, we have the transformation of, the, of what happened to the recession of 2008. And in 2010, we see the fragmentation of Latinx audiences as well. So we need to take that into consideration when we're talking about how we move around the world and how media moves around the world with us. So for more than two centuries, the Spanish and which uh, I'm bilingual, Hispanic media have grown and changed alongside the growing communities they serve. Originally an advocate of immigrants marginalized by discrimin discriminatory political, linguistic, and cultural policies, the Spanish and which media today serve a growing communities of Latinx people born in the United States and abroad, educated in English and speaking Spanish at home. To meet the specific information and communication needs of diverse set of communities, the Spanish and which media landscape is broad. It's heterogeneous and it's patterns of production, distribution, and consumption. So we're not talking about one static reality. Following the rapid growth of the 90s and the, and the 2000s, the Spanish daily newspapers, they saw a 10% decline in circulation over the past years, cons consistent with other media sectors. And it's a digital divide across language, age, and immigrant status, a number of bilingual and English language digital media for young Latinx audiences have emerged over the past 10 years. As more Latinx become bilingual, Spanish language media companies are increasing their English language offering, while English language media is offering also Spanish. This is a, the, the face of uh, the Spanish language uh, print market in the 2011, and this is how we are being distributed. And of course, we've seen a decline of circulation because it's, it's happening also for general market as well. Radio is important for us because our listenership is higher than the rest of the other groups. So we consume a lot of radio, and if we see uh, the distribution of the radio also match the geographical concentration and geographical dispersion. Uh, of course, Los Angeles, New York, and Miami are the biggest uh, audiences, but in the offering, we, what we see is mainly um, music and entertainment, and we see that we have a pending debt here also, because we need to, I think, uh, there is an opportunity for us to push for more news media production and distribution in Latino radio in the U.S. Quite the same with television uh, and then the major, the major um, te television networks, but also new networks that um, came to, to, to us in the, especially in the last 15 um, years, 20 years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges. I'm very conscious about the time. I really want to spend time in the Q&A. One of the ideas that I want to bring to the discussion is one challenge is the business model. With advertising crisis, with the economic recession of 2008, most of the media has been to force to reinvent themselves, right? Uh, in the Latinx media, we have a staff reduction, increased workload, a few resources for reporting. Uh, so it, it has been challenging for them. In mainstream media, there is also low participation of Latinx decision-making areas. I want to highlight these two um, campaigns that uh, were uh, pushed by a Latinx um, journalist in uh, Los Angeles Times and Arizona Republic that are asking for more representation of Latino journalists in uh, more uh, decision areas in mainstream media publication. Mm -hmm. Also the technologi technological conversion that is um, um, forcing the, trans the transition from legacy to multimedia model from reporters producing all in one reported so that it's challenging to, to help the students understand that they cannot work as I worked as a journalist when I was a typewriter or a, a tape recorder um, uh, reporter, but now I need to uh, explain my students how to use their models to do multimedia production, right? And understand also this, the, 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 this other inclusion of the social media engagement and also the, the, in the incursion of data journalism or computer assistant reporting. So it's a lot of challenges that we add to the professional uh, itself. But this is the more challenging for us, and that has been happening for the, all the years that we have had Spanish language publications in the, US, the USA. The bilingual production, reporting in English, reporting in Spanish, writing in English, writing in Spanish, and understand, inform, and uh, create different Latinx audiences. When it comes to the, the, the digital momentum, we will see, of course, now we know the history of the demographics of Latinos, we know the history of Latinx media, it's easier to understand the digital component of this, right? So we will have people that prefer to go more online in English and it matches with this 
group of audiences that are more into English and more to um, Latino audiences. If we were in person, I will ask the audience, so which group, which group is that? And some would say younger generation. Yes, you're right. Okay, so the older you are, uh, you are more um, challenged. Um, ch I'm, I'm thinking about mm, mm, how hard is sometimes when you have a Skype meeting or a FaceTime meeting with elder um, people. So it's challenging uh, to understand, but sometimes they can um, go faster into, into this. But this will help us understand all these diverse, uh, com the complexity of our audiences, right? So it's the same if you go to age, you see age and language and, and, and uh, place of birth. Uh, this is all Pew Research Center, as you all know. Uh, Pew does a lot of uh, reports uh, on Latino media consumption and Latino consum um, um, Latino um, cultural and consumption practices. So what we're seeing now, and I'm trying to to finish with these few slides, is the Latinx oriented news media. So we have Latinx media broadcast conglomerate, print online, digital only, in Spanish, in English, in Spanish, mainstream media targeting Latino first, covering Latino first digital only media, from English to Spanish, Spanish only, but we also have Latin American media, Latin, targeting Latinx, recovering Latino first, digital only from Spanish to English, which is very interesting. So we have examples like Remes, Flamitu, Pero Like, Radio Ambulante, Latino Rebels, Latino USA, right, you name it, that we have, and, and they are doing an absolutely fantastic job in, in, in um, informing the audiences in different ways, actually, right? We have Latinx oriented news media from the mainstream, sometimes with positive or negative results. Uh, we, unfortunately, we've, we've seen the New York Times closed the New York Times in Espanol, Chicago Tribune uh, closed the uh, old Chicago. But we've seen that uh, Washington Post just launched the WAPO Opinion and the podcast. USA Today launched the Hecho in Mexico, NBC Telemundo, uh, they share newsroom. They have several students uh, reporting in English and Spanish and then um, covering all these different in different languages, right? And we have, for example, El Faro, uh, a, a, a very, uh, very interesting newspaper in El Salvador, just launching the, 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 the English language version. We can have that discussion later on. A little bit of advertising. <laughs> I'm teaching this class, Global Latinos, at, at the University of Arizona. This is part of what we are offering uh, in the Master of Bilingual Journalism, what we can talk about in the Q&A. But basically, what I want to, um, my closing remarks is our the theoretical approach. We need to incorporate critical perspectives, such as political economy of the media, cultural studies, urban studies, media practices in everyday uh, day life, uh, because I think that there are useful approaches in to incorporate this interdisciplinary understanding of Latinx diasporas and the media. It's not a static uh, picture, right? And how, in, in, uh, along these years that I have been conducting all these research uh, projects, um, I have seen media production, distribution, and consumption, and what I'm seeing is uh, we have diverse variables, such as the stage of immigration, the process of migration, the generational, the new technologies gaps, and the social environments. And this is important. In the city of origins and the city of destinies, when we uh, want to understand um, these um, media practices. So that's for context, uh, it were transformed by new spaces of production, distribution, and consumption for mass media, and the last decade by new communication technologies. So territorial immigrants were transformed into digital immigrants in a complex and changing process affecting both Latin Americans living abroad and their family and friends who remain in the origins of place. This is very important to understand because in the Q&A we can talk about transnational consumption as well. So inter to interdisciplinary approaches to processes of, of economic globalization require rethinking the traditional ways of examining national society's relationship to network system, I'm using Castells here, that have led to the territorialization of social life and transform cultural dimensions, I'm, just, I'm using a puzzle right here, and reconfigured notes in the form of global cities, I'm using Saskia Sassen here. In this context, Links established between uh, for migration networks outline new disparate spaces relying on transborder secrets, communication, and information. And I want to, to finish with uh, a piece that I uh, just, um, uh, it's about to be published in the Sage Encyclopedia of Journalism. It's for Kami. Latin news media is a product of bilingual journalism practices that require by cultural competencies to gather, access, present, and disseminate news and information about or relevant to Latin, Latinx communities offering in Spanish, in English, or bilingually, 
it engages with the understanding of foreign affairs, but also the history, the economics, the politics, and the culture of diverse groups, whether youth born or immigrants, as well as the global liaisons with the countries where they trace their origins, um, right? And the internet was a foremost used source of news behind television, radio, newspapers. 10 years later, it became the most used news source for Latin audiences. Behind this trend lie significant divides across generations, language use, and immigrant status among, among Latinos in the post broadcast or post digital era. Uh, and with the advent of social media, Latinx news production, dissemination, and consumption are transnational and bilingual. It goes beyond reporting into languages, but understanding linguistic and cultural diversity, as well as innovative ways of storytelling in the digital age. Thank you, muchas gracias. Gracias, muchas gracias, uh, Jessica, for this excellent presentation. Um, so let me see. Um, we have to remove the spotlight. We already have uh, several questions. Uh, Mei Ling, would you like to, um, to start uh, with the Q&A? Sure. Um, I'll take, um, you have a question from Selena that says, there are 60 million Latinos in the US, but just 27.3 million are eligible to vote. How can the cultural citizenship variable help that number go up? And is it, is it possible to establish a direct link between the two? Well, it's a very interesting question. Uh, well, we need to talk about uh, the processes of um, getting the citizenship, which is not an easy journey for so many Latinos, right? And uh, that's on, on one hand. On the other hand is the process of voting itself it's not an easy pattern in the United States because you need to register, you need to do so several steps um, to uh, actually cast your vote. So, which is why we have so many Latin organizations actually helping Latinx communities and bilingual communities understand the process itself. So, the more we can uh, advocate and we can uh, inform our uh, communities into, into the importance of register and understand the process, the more we're gonna gain space within um, the electorate. But it's uh, absolutely challenging for, for, for a group. So our representation is, is unbalanced. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Um, there is a, a very interesting question about homogenizing heterogeneity. Right, um, and, and this participant asks, uh, why homogenize? Okay, so uh, when I'm playing with these uh, two words, basically I am uh, working with all Latinx researchers that have been doing this research for so uh, many years, and they uh, criticize this idea of having this ethnic level, right? It all started from uh, the census, but also all the marketing strategies in trying to put us all together as we were all an homogeneous group without differences, that we are all the same race, we are all the same religion, we are all the same, the same, the same, same. When you homogenize a very diverse group, it's useful for these different areas, for uh, politics and administrative uh, reasons, but also for marketing, it's easier to sell products, right? So what, what um, critical researchers are starting uh, analyzing is that, well, we are very diverse. We need to uh, work around this, our, our diversity. I'm thinking about Arlene Davila and all the, the professors that, uh, Stella professors are gonna talk about this uh, later on in these seminars, which I absolutely recommend. They're gonna talk about uh, gender, uh, they're gonna talk about uh, citizenship. They have brought and published a lot of very interesting and critical studies about um, uh, Latino media um, studies, right? So basically what uh, the consensus of the critical perspective on Latinx media is that homogenizing these, uh, our diversity uh, pushed uh, our invisibility, right? So if we uh, walk back and forth with, okay, we have some similarities, but we also have our differences, it would be more interesting to understand 
the richness of our culture, right? And also different levels of uh, language um, skills that we have. Excellent. Jessica, we have a number of other questions. I'm gonna squeeze a little uh, question for myself in here. What do you think are, what are some of your favorite um, new um, outlets or um, outlets that, that have potential both as a storytelling model, a reporting model, and a business, uh, and possibly as a business model? Yeah, well, if we go back to the new, um, uh, what um, Radio Ambulante is doing, Spanish language production to understand Latin, Latin American realities, Latino USA that is being distributed at NPR, uh, very interesting um, way to understand a reality in English because that this is very important for us to understand. We need to go into both languages. We, it, uh, if you, we only think on silos, uh, it's going to separate our understanding. We, we want to, we go back and forth, right? Yo empiezo a hablar en español y algunos me entienden. Go back to English, también me entienden. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, our, uh, this is our reality, and then this is the beauty of being bilingual. So I always tell my students, because unfortunately for some Latino students in high school, they're being told that they are less because they speak Spanish. I always tell them it's the other way around. You're smarter because you speak two languages and you understand um, two languages and your brains are connected, right? So I think uh, these uh, um, proposals that we have, especially digital native, I'm, I'm only mentioning a few, but uh, apologize for the ones that uh, I'm not going to see their names there because I know you are there, but we, I only uh, posted a few, uh, but there are so many now. And, and, and I'm thinking about, for example, the Boyle Heights, the project that they are doing with younger um, Latinos, young Latinos in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. They're doing a great job with hyperlocal coverage. So they are opportunities for us. I have the local labels in English, in Spanish. So we have opportunities. The thing is that we cannot think about Latinx media as mass media anymore because we need to realize that we are in a fragmented audiences um, era right now. On that note, we have a, a question from the audience that asks why the Spanish version of the New York Times didn't work, right? The New York Times in Espanol um, uh -huh. failed um, last year, in, and you mentioned OI. Yes, yes. If you if you see uh, if you read the Hispanic media today, you will see other examples. Not only New York Times, but also uh, some other examples. A um, Fox Latino and, and several uh, in different areas, print, television, etc. The thing is that because the constituency of Latinx communities is very diverse, whenever you want to try to to, to cater only one group. It's going to be very complicated, right? So, and also, if you think about the um, challenge of the revenues, that's the other point. So, the challenge of revenue, the challenge of the, the, the model, and the challenge that we have different Latinx audiences. So, if you don't mix match these from a business model, uh, it's going to be hard to maintain these projects, right? So. We can, we can think about the different examples because there are, there are many examples. I will answer that question with how come USA Today just started an, uh, the, uh, a new university? How come um, the Washington Post started the podcast? And you see, so there are different um, areas and we also have, let's say, El Tecolote in San Francisco, still around and giving a very good public service and we have um, Spanish language production and KPFK, uh, news and cultural uh, radio production. So several, there's no, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say, there's no one answer. It's like, it depends on the different uh, examples that we uh, can bring to the discussion. Excellent, Jessica, may I add another question that sort of follows up from that, from uh, another attendee that says, it is hard for Latinx media produced in the US to go mainstream and get audience outside uh, the Latinx community, so within that community itself. But what about Latinx journalism produced outside the United States? What can we, as who are currently living in Latin America, do to expand bilingual journalism both in our own countries and in the States? So that person is asking from Latin America, I guess, right? Correct. Yeah, Correct. so for example, it's interesting, I just brought the example of El Faro, right? So the uh, Spanish newspaper El País, they have the English version for so long now. They have the 
Portuguese version uh, also. So this is very interesting. Due to these new technologies and the digital revolution, we cannot think about newsroom as geographical boundaries anymore. So the more we realize that, and especially with Latino communities. So if, if we were in person, I will ask, who has family in Latin America, right? And we all raise our hands, right? We, we, who, who come from Christmas or Rosh Hashanah or whatever we celebrate? Yes. So we have these transnational lives. So we're talking about transnational audiences. So we're, we're very interesting because people in El Salvador are going to be interested of what happens to Salvadorians in Los Angeles or Salvadorians in Washington, right? So we need to start realizing that. So which is why when we started the project of the bilingual, uh, the master's in bilingual journalism, our approach is we need to understand our transnational realities. And this is how you move back and forth with languages. The most important part and the challenging, I think the challenge for um, journalists is to understand that you're not talking to a big mass media audience anymore, but you're talking to different fragmented audiences. So you want to talk about, uh, you want to talk to Latinx millennial, you are going to embrace the Latinx word. You know that we, we have these pros and cons of using the Latinx word, uh, which is more inclusive, right? Because languages are alive and we need to evolve with our society. So um, I'm, I'm for this usage. I, I think in the future it would take more, more uh, people accepting the reality that, that we need to be more inclusive without LGBT communities with different sexual orientations, etc. Religion, not religion, politics, not politics, conservative, um, um, and progressive. We are very diverse, and also the Latino community. So, in regards of um, uh, our uh, the editorial perspective, also, you have um, Latinx audiences that are more conservative, depending on what areas you're talking about. So, I guess my answer to to that journalist is that. Uh, try to educate yourself into understanding your audiences and who you are going to talk to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question, um, one that's near and dear to both of our hearts, I'm sure. What do you think should be the first step for an immigrant journalist who has just arrived in, to America to join the country's media system? So ants by the job, right? Okay, oh, I can talk about this like for four hours, but we only have four seconds. <laughs> Take your time, oh. Jessica, no rush. Okay. So wherever you are, because you are new in the city, walk around, act like a real journalist. You cannot get into the newsroom and not have a clue about who is who, is who in your neighborhood. It's, it's very important, act like a journalist, right? So be sort of an anthropologist if you, if you may know your communities, know your organizations, know where, what they are doing. For example, with my students, now we're doing this mapping of Latino organizations. And they were like, why are we doing this? And I'm telling them, we're doing reverse engineering. Because if you see all these analysis of um, um, mainstream media representation of Latinos, they talk about Latinos. They don't talk to Latinos, they talk with Latinos. And why? Because it takes time, effort, and of course money to go reporting out there and to, to, to get to know what they are doing, right? And the organizations are doing a very important job. So if you want to do that, know your organizations, know your uh, neighborhood, uh, and, and talk to people in unions, talk to people in different uh, professional organizations, get to know your audience, get to know your reality, and know the door of the newsroom. <laughs> Excellent. Now, in terms of not getting to know your reality, uh, there are a couple of questions about language um, that I'm going to combine into one. One has to do with adapting the language of bilingualism to social media, right, where the text has to be very short. Um, and how do uh, people decide, you know, whether to use English or Spanish in the different platforms and for which kind of content. And then there is another question about language that says, you know, if you ever foresee in the future that, um, you know, inclusive language to be included in Latinx media in the US. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm gonna answer with an example. We are Christmas time, we're all together. 
we have the abuela, then la tía, then la tía with el novio que es gringo, then the teenagers that only speak English, then the baby, blah, 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 right? And we all- Work on the dog. <laughs> and, the, yeah, and the dog, because of course the dog is bilingual, of course. Of right? course. So, and then we have the telenovela here, and then you have all the teenagers with the laptops or laptops, their cell phones. And so this is a reality. So I, when, when people ask me, okay, uh, in English or in Spanish or what, I, I always say all, the, all of the above, because it depends on who are you talking to. So if you're going to talk about what's going on in the state of Puebla for uh, people from Mexico, from Puebla that are living in New York, you know you're talking about these immigrants and that they live in Queens and they just came from Puebla and Veracruz and they are being, uh, they live there and they're interested in what's going on because they've been in New York for only 15 years, right? But if you're gonna talk about Boyle Heights, for example, with US born Latin second or third generation, then you're talking about, you're talking about and with, right? Uh, a different group of Latinos that prefer to communicate in English which is okay. So you, you choose what language you want to use. You choose what identity you, you, uh, the best reflects uh, you, right? That's, that's important. And another uh, suggestion for my journalists, I always tell my, my reporters in, in class, ask your source how they, how they identify. They can say, I'm Mexican, or they can say, I'm, I'm from Oaxaca, I'm Oaxaqueño. Or they can say, I'm Sudamerican, I'm Colombian, I'm from Bogota, I'm the Caracas. Go for it. So ask your, your, your sources. Don't assume, don't decipher them. Always ask them, right? And in regards of language, use the language that they are using to communicate. For example, I just opened a TikTok and my students are, Prof, you have TikTok, of course, because there is a conversation going on there, right? And I want to know what's going on. And I always say to my students, you are in your 20s. Your future audience, it's coming later on. And the, the babies are already with the iPads in their hands. So you, you better start learning what's going on. I'm educating myself anytime I, I teach my classes. I, I never, uh, I, I've, I've done television, radio, print, um, magazines, you name it. But I didn't work as going with my cell phone and, and social media, et cetera. We, all the professors, need to educate ourselves in order to, to be better trainers. That's, yes, we go to training. Of course, we go to training, so we can incorporate that in our schools. So that would be my, my answer for them. Um, learn what kind of group of audience you're talking to, and then you use that language that better fits the communication with them. And sometimes you will realize you can use Spanish. Like the first time I was turning in uh, any Latino radio in Los Angeles, they were like, buenos dias, we're gonna have coffee porque me gusta que mi abuelita me hace el café con mucha azúcar because I like it the way it is. And I was like, what just happened? And then that is my reality now. I go back and forth with languages. So the beauty of this is that we can go back and forth. So Spanish is already in place. <laughs> Thank you, that was a great answer. Um, we had a couple questions from folks that asked specifically how hard it is to get a job as a Latin American or a Latinx um, journalist in, I think they're asking in the U.S. So you're talking about mainstream media or Latino media or? I think they're not specific, but how hard is it to get, you know, in the circumstances that we find ourselves right now in the industry and well, yeah, yeah, okay, so, okay, yeah, I got it. So uh, the, the, the uh, journalism business is in the process of reinventing itself. So School of Journalism, we are reinventing ourselves as well. Uh, there is no right and wrong. I would say we are, all we are doing is try and error, and sometimes we try and, and it's working, and sometimes we try and it's not working, so they decide not to do that, so you will see that, uh, for example, Fusion with uh, Univision, right? So it was a try and error. Then NBC Latino was a try and error. So you, you see that the different newsrooms are trying to accommodate these uh, complex realities. And because we've been used for so many years to talk about the Latino booms and the mass media and the profits were 
uh, enormous. Now that we have in these fragmented audiences, it's very hard for business models to understand the way to go with these new realities. So, uh, which is why uh, facing the new technologies and facing the challenges of less investment through advertising is affecting the newsroom because I visit several newsrooms and sometimes uh, the, my, my first visits were like, ah, like all, all the noise and the more I visit newsroom is like, where was Jane and where is Juan? And where is, no, he's not with us anymore, etc. So then you have newsrooms with three reporters to cover among those geographical areas. So it's, it's challenging. I would say if you want to get a job in the um, journalist industry, uh, you need to be a good reporter. So the basis for journalists have to be there, accuracy, look for the truth, and then uh, your user sources and investigate, right? But also you have the other challenge of new technologies. You need to be able to shoot a video, edit it, um, you know, record audio and edit, and then uh, use social media, engage with your communities, and then lanzar una castanuela, right? So it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, that's my students is like, uh, at the very beginning when I was um, teaching them, it's like, ready, she asked for everything. It's like, it's not that I'm asking for everything. It's when you go out in the newsroom, your editors are going to ask you for a photo, a video, an audio, and then you'll be able to use your cell phone to have a good shoot, a decent shoot with light, and of course, a, a good um, audio quality. We have time for one more question. And um, given that I have two, not just one, experts in bilingual journalism, Jessica and Mei Ling here, I, um, I would like to ask you from your perspectives about you know, this as educators, right? Do you see, given all that you shared with us, Jessica, and all that we know about the growth of uh, the Latinx population in the US, do you see that the future of journalism and education is bilingual or do you see um, the classes like my link teaches or the program that you are launching, Jessica asks for like exceptions or a niche, um, you know, initiatives. Meline, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, well, I would actually add on to that. I think um, the future is in multicultural, multilingual um, education, incorporating many different perspectives and views. Even our, you know, we had our first year, I did a lecture on identity yesterday. The incredible diversity in our classes right now is, a, you know, it requires that. And I think that, um, as you were saying, Jessica, the ability to be agile um, technologically, do video, audio, uh, inter um, interactive, and to be agile culturally and, and be able to speak different languages and move and be um, humble and respectful and conscious as you do that reporting will be more and more part of what we do all around, not just for our bilingual programs uh, or our uh, global programs. Mm -hmm. Jessica, what do you think? Yeah, uh, what happens, and, and I've been confirming this for so many years, sometimes um, the industries work faster than the academia. So we have to catch up, right? Because they are already, NBC Telemundo is already working with students that, well, I have a couple of former students that they have, they, they report in English and they go to Spanish, right? So the academia needs, we need to catch up with that. Um, and we can, for good and bad, in the academia, we can also experiment, right? And see what, what works better for the students. And then educators, we need to be aware of what's going out there because you cannot be a journalism educator and not um, busy the newsrooms. And then, well, COVID right now happens, so it's kind of hard. But before, uh, before the, 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 the pandemic, uh, we, we, we had that opportunity, right? To be very connected with, with the industry as well but also not only with the commercial and private industry, but also the, the community-based organizations and the nonprofit organizations because they are doing a fantastic job and there are opportunities also, and there are some funds that a student can um, uh, use to work on a um, very interesting um, journalism project. So I want to be optimistic, uh, call me a romantic. Um, this is 
why I'm here, right? I'm training students, so I, I, I see a, a light and I want to be um, positive in the sense that I think there's, there are plenty of opportunities to keep informing our communities. We just need to realize that our realities are not the same like 10 years ago. Right. So I as, Sorry, I don't know, Jessica, but I would add that enrollments in journalism and communication schools are up despite everything that's happening because there is a sense among our young people that they want to change things. They want things to keep evolving and influence things. So despite, you know, the anti-journalism rhetoric or, or things, we're seeing enrollments or admissions that are just surprising. So, I mean, I guess that's a positive side of it. Yes, and more than ever, this is a profession that, that we need in our society. We need a watchdog, we need people telling the stories, and we need people doing investigative reporting and opening up information that a regular citizen can, would not be able to, to, to know about if it wasn't for um, a journalist, right? And it wasn't for a bilingual journalist. So I, for the, the younger people that are here, students of journalism, I hope you're out there, uh, you're young, learn another language, look at me, I double your age, and I started learning Japanese. If I can do it, you can do it. So go for it. Uh, you have many possibilities. You don't have to be an expert in the language. Uh, basically to communicate and talk to the different groups and understand what they are saying. The more you understand more diverse groups, the better professional you're going to be. All right, Jessica, my link, I couldn't think of a better way to end this seminar. The questions keep coming in, but you are mindful of your time and that in this time, so we are going to end up here. I want to thank uh, my friend and colleague, Maylin Hopwood, for uh, co-hosting and co-moderating this with me. Uh, Jessica Bretis uh, for a wonderful talk and a very, very engaging Q&A session. Um, I want to also thank people behind the scenes, Mora Matassi, the coordinator of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, and Facundo Suenzo, a student at Northwestern University, also providing uh, support. And I wanna thank everybody for being here and invite you to the next uh, week uh, seminar with Hector Amaya from the University of Southern California. We're gonna post the details in just a couple of hours. So please uh, join us for that seminar as well. And again, Thank you so much. I couldn't think of really a better way to uh, start this journey for the Center for Latinx Digital Media. I hope everybody has a great rest of your days and see you all next week. Bye now. Gracias. Adios.